delighted to be with you again. I remembered very fondly the last time we had the opportunity uh, to have an interaction around breakfast. Uh, it was, what, uh, a year ago. I thought about what the Lord would have me speak to you uh, this morning. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's, it's a combination of things that are vo both personal and um, that look toward a, a global picture. We'll start with the, with the, uh, the first subject, um, your place in a global setting, in a global marketplace. In many ways, um, coming of age uh, in business in South Africa in these particular times has very severe challenges to it. On the one hand, uh, what is required in, in every environment of business is some measure of predictability, some measure of certainty, metrics we call them. Um, at a personal level, you obviously face daily challenges of uh, the normal things, supply, markets, uh, employees, um, HR matters, and so on. But then when you add an additional layer to that of uh, the fluctuation of currencies and exchanges, uh, as they relate to, say, decisions taken by government, concerning which you have no, uh, no real input, but being affected uh, um, in very personal and, and uh, dramatic ways by those decisions, it can create uh, a sense of uh, uncertainty and severe challenges. And certainly those face you here in South Africa at this point. When you overlay that with a growing uncertainty in the global climate, uh, especially those of you who have to receive supplies from abroad or have markets that are affected by, um, by uh, these sorts of factors, uncertainty grows virtually on, on every level. And I'm sure there are many mornings when you get up and think, why am I doing this? You know, uh, is there a way, can I sell this thing? Can I move off and, and um, you know, and go up, go up to maybe the Chobi for a while? Uh, but there, what, what holds you, what keeps you steady is the sense of calling, that God has called you. God has called you to this thing. Um, I don't think pastors often realize uh, the challenges, uh, the extraordinary challenges that face people in business. Because uh, one week to another, there's a kind of sameness in, in the pastoral uh, work. Things do not change dramatically in that world. And so there's, there's almost a sense in that world of um, uh, disconnect, if you like, disconnect to the world of business. If you want to think about a world that is real, where you have to make decisions in real time, and where the consequences of what you do come home to visit you uh, very rapidly, it's the world of business. Um, if you think of real life, I think you are as much on the front line uh, of what is considered real life as, uh, as any other enterprise. And sometimes, you know, uh, I don't know that um, what, what things are said from the pulpit uh, is of special uh, help to you. It's almost that businessmen are... Um, businessmen and women, are required to supply the church um, but have no say in the directions of things. Um, 
we, we have bifurcated reality in, and compartmentalized life into church life and business life. And uh, we, we are, you are generally considered the economic engine of the church, um, but uh, your, your observations and your perspectives are not typically viewed as valuable in, in spiritual matters. And this bifurcation, I think, is tragic um, because on one hand, it, it reduces you to simply being suppliers of funds. Uh, it's almost like, give us the money and, and, and leave it. let us do the God things. Um, I think what God is doing in the world today is having an effect of shaking that, that, um, that mindset, shaking it up uh, to produce a more realistic view of both what the problems are and what the mind of the Lord is. Now, one of the things that, um, that you, uh, you recognize, and one of the ways you're being able to be held at arm's length, say, by the pastoral leader, leadership of, of the church, is the suggestion that somehow your expertise in business um, is, should be relegated to business, and or that your knowledge of things of the scriptures is not sufficient for you to make meaningful contributions to the discussion of what God is saying. So what I want to do this morning is to talk to you about hearing God. I want to talk to you, business people, about hearing God. And I think the value of this is that you have... Um, you have perhaps a richer environment in which to implement the hearing of God than almost any other context. You do daily need to hear God. Um, in, in the milieu of all these problems that we're talking about, from the local, personal, centered in your own business, to the national, to the international, these layers of complexity that characterize your daily lives in various forms um, require you to hear God. As men and women who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not do for you to have business practices separate and apart from your life as a son of God. In fact, uh, as was mentioned, I have... Uh, I have quite a number of sons who are businessmen. And I'll, I'll tell you just one example of, of one of these sons. Maybe I'll give you two. Usually when you do that, you give your two best examples. Um, one son, a few years ago, when he, when he first became a spiritual son, and I'll talk about the whole matter of having a spiritual father. Uh, he was on the verge of divorce. And um, I was sort of the last stop. And his connection to me was through his in-laws. They said, you know, we hate to see them divorce, meaning, you know, their daughter and this son-in-law who became my spiritual son. We hate to see them divorce. Is there anything you can do? And I said, well, I'll meet with him. I'll talk with him. And uh, we talked. When he came, he wanted to talk about the affair he had. I said, no, that's not the place to start. Tell me about your life. Tell me about who you are. And um, I think that took him by surprise because, you know, he had all the defenses. He had the three points. He had the PowerPoint presentation ready for me <laughs> to defend himself because in his world and in his mind, I was iconic. And uh, he, he, was he was prepared to defend his reputation uh, uh, with me. And I just batted it aside. I said, no, I'm, I'm interested in you. You tell, tell me about who you are. 
So he delineated a story for me, which is actually one of the most heartbreaking stories I've ever heard. And it had to do with a child who grew up with a father that was badly malfunctioning. And his only view of life, he said to me, he said, um, my, 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 my father had a picture of me at the age of four, age of four years, sitting on a tractor, uh, because that was his view of what was important to him. His prized picture of me was me at the age of four, sitting on a tractor, uh, 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 you know, a farm tractor. And he said it wasn't too long after that he learned to drive a tractor. Because performance was all that mattered to his father. And the story was how the father would, as a young man growing up, the father would make all these kinds of bad decisions. And he was driven by a variety of passions. And this son, from about the age of 17, got into the business of bailing his father out. At the same time, his father was, a, was an elder in one of the churches. And so he grew up with a real love for God. However, there was no, no sense of propriety, no sense of order. And the only thing that he knew was performance. Uh, every morning he got up with the idea of his worth being tied up with what he did. And he grew up that way. Now, it did not excuse at all the adultery. But what it did say was, here was a young man searching for an identity. It didn't have anything to, really to do with sex. It had to do with measures of manhood. Was he really a man? Uh, in business, he was almost robotic. Um, he could just churn out the numbers get it done. Um, it was as though his conscience um, had been suspended. Now he'd make ethical decisions for the, in business for the most part, but it was, it was robotic. He was being driven by, not even driven by money or making money. He was driven to keep score. He was driven to, to be successful. When I talked to his two children at the time, they would say they were afraid of their dad. And his wife was clearly always living on the edge. The, the, those were obvious results, but the causation was in the fact that this was just how he approached life. This was his view of life. His view of life was, I have value if I outperform everybody else. And he was, I mean, he was rushing headlong into a life of prolonged disappointments. You, you could see the rest of the story, that he would end up quite wealthy, but he would be the last one to leave the bars. And, um, and at the end of, uh, by the time of middle age, he would have probably been on his second or third or fourth wife. And the children, uh, the, he'd leave a trail of fatherless children. And at the end of his life, perhaps he'd leave them some money. And that's, that's where he was when I met him. So we had a long set of discussions about his emotions, who he was emotionally. And we've continued to have those discussions. But the transformation in his life has been stunning, absolutely stunning. I took the place of that father. One of the things I asked him, I said, you know, here is this man, your father, who claimed to represent God, and yet his behavior has, uh, has been devoid of anything Christ-like. He said, so I'm going to stand in the place of one who abused you in this way because I too am a man of God. 
And somebody needs to admit that you were treated badly. Somebody needs to take responsibility for what has happened to you. So I asked him if he would consider forgiving me for abusing him by presenting a false vision of what a father is. I mean, this stoic guy with, with, a, with a face of flint that you didn't want to cross the table from you uh, because he would scrub you down on every aspect of the deal. He was that brilliant. He's actually a genius in business because he focused his entire energy and emotions on understanding every nuance of business. He was stunned. It took him, it took him several, it, you know, in no, those environments, it seems like a few seconds is an eternity. And then he broke and he just started to weep. And he managed to, to get out through his tears, I forgive you. Then he got his composure back. You could see the wall going back up, but something had changed. But it didn't change immediately. It didn't change immediately. It changed over a series of exchanges uh, with me. Shortly after that, he was approached to sell his business. And he called me up and we had a discussion. And I said to him, I said, you know, the problem is you've reached as far as you can go with your access to capital because you're operating at a certain level. So these persons who want to buy your business, they can solve your capital problem. But you're going to have to exchange the solution for your capital problem for ownership in the business. I said, you will, you will not be the owner, the primary owner, but invest as much of the, of the sale price, insist. That, I said, this is what they're going to do. They're going to ask you, uh, for a package. They're going to, in addition to the price that they're going to pay for the business, they're going to ask for a three year commitment for you to run the business. And basically, what they're asking you to do is make sure that their investment in your company succeeds. So it's a ride that train, ride the train, and insist that you get up to a third of the shares of the new company as a combination of your investment and your, your financial investment and your time. And he said, well, they're really only offering me business development. I said, that's the engine that drives the whole thing. So yeah, take business development, but before long, you'll run the whole company because they don't know what they're doing. They will use you and have a figurehead through whom they filter all your, your information to make the decisions. So, you know, just freely give them the information they're paying you for and, uh, and see what happens. So he sold the business, um, he and his partner, and I think the business sold, his portion was probably about seven or eight million out of, out of that deal. Well, Things happened exactly as we said. Um, and uh, he took the position of business developer. In that time, it became apparent that he knew exactly how to run the business. He knew what to do with the new entity. And the, the CEO, who was a, um, a high-flying uh, person they brought in from another country uh, to run it, um, really didn't know what he was doing. But uh, the, the board was watching uh, all of this. And the board was actually a foreign board. So uh, they were watching all of this and they were watching his attitude. They said, the test for you here is can you let go? Is this your identity? Is the control of this business your identity or do you have a different identity? So he went through this, he began his growth spurt as a believer, 
within the context of business decisions. Because hmm? that's where God's going to meet you. Right where you are, he's going to grow you up. He was shrunken down emotionally, and, and everything about control was a test of his value to himself. And what God began to do with him is to, to cause him to have to deal with the issue of control in his life because it was the absolute bar to his growth as a person. Bar to his growth as a, as a man of God. So I began to teach him how to be a man of God, a mature man of God within business. I knew what the issue was for him and I knew what the challenges would be for him. But he never had a father before that. He went to church but there was the pastor and you know he, he was a good supplier of, of finances for the church and so on but he never actually had a father. Because what a father does, a father knows his son. And one of the things a father knows about his son is where he's stuck. What a father knows about a son is what he's capable of being. And how to help him navigate from where he's stuck to his capability is something most men and women in business have no access to. I was not trying to tell him how to run the business. He could run circles around me in terms of business knowledge, strategies, you know, and, and uh, valuations and uh, personnel, all of those things. Uh, I, I wasn't called to add value to that. I was called to add value to him as a man of God. And I kept saying to him, you know, you're a man of God. I said, God put Joseph in a business position in Egypt. It was Joseph's skill in business that saved his own family up in Canaan, saved the nation. It was, he, Joseph was not a preacher in Egypt. Preachers often use him as an example for a lot of reasons. But Joseph was a businessman, one of the most skilled businessmen in Egypt. And it was his skill that saved the nation and saved his family. In fact, God allowed him to go to Egypt to save Judah, who was carrying the seed. So do not for one moment think that what you do when you go down to the office does not have eternal consequences. All right? You're not just pew sitters. You're people of destiny. And I understood that. In fact, all of my sons in business, uh, business is just where they are, but the, the process of raising them up to maturity uh, is, the, is the key thing to be done within the context of their lives. I have sons who are professors and deans and those things. And I also have, a, I, I, have I do have sons who are, who are just ordinary people as, as well. But um, in every case, in every case, the role of a father is to help the son understand who he is, what is his destiny, what is his calling, what are the impediments that block the way, where is he weak, where is he vulnerable. You can't ever tell those things to your competitors because that's exactly what they want to know about you, to take advantage of you. And you can't tell those things to the board they'll likely fire you. you, know, you so you, uh, many of you are as isolated as pastors are. You'll often hear pastors say, well, I can't talk to the congregation about these issues I'm having in my family because they'll lose confidence in me. You have to always be brave. You have to always be out front. You have to always look like you know what you're doing. But you know the reality. it ends up being where you focus very narrowly on tasks and task orientation and accomplishing things and neglect the rest of your lives 
for the most part. Because you know very well, money doesn't solve the problem when your kids are on drugs. You know. In fact, it's almost like you have to say, I can't deal with that now. Um, I've, I've got this deal that I need to complete. But you're meant to have a whole life, a complete life. Otherwise, it's gone before you know it. And you're in retirement wondering what it was all about. You are not put here to just to be a business person. You're put here to be a son of God in business. And your, your whole life has to be attended, not just your business life. And the attention to those aspects of your life that are, that are fraught with dangers and pitfalls has to be handled as carefully as your finances. In fact, perhaps more so. I understood that when I took this son on. And so, one day he, he calls me up very excitedly and he said, um, uh, I've been called to, I'm, I'm not always sure the scope of what, uh, of who listens to me. So I'm careful with the details so that people can't identify themselves in the examples that I give. One day he calls me up and he says, I'm going to go to this country where the headquarters of the purchasers of our business are, uh, where the headquarters are. And he said, what do you think they're calling me over there for? I said, it's simple, they're going to offer you the CEO position. He said, no, nah. he said, we have a CEO. I said, they've already decided that the CEO is not doing the job and that you're doing the job. They're going to offer you being the CEO. So prepare to answer them uh, as to how you would run the company. And I said, do not lay a glove on the, C the current CEO. Say nothing that's derogatory. In fact, find the good points when you defend him. So defend his position to the board. He said, well, I, you know, I don't really... I don't really know, this is new territory for me. I said, listen to me. Defend the present CEO to the board and point out his good qualities. I said, they're going to be measuring you by how you treat your opponents. But you'll come away. I said, here's what I want you to come away from from this business, from this headquarters. I want you to come away with the purse of the headquarters. And I want you to come away with all of their contacts. Because when you conclude this business, you're going to be in a global environment. And this is where, this is, these are the contacts, these are the things you need. You need a reputation that is impeccable and they'll give you their contacts if they judge that your reputation is as sterling as, it's, as, it's, as it is. So they, they've already made the decision. The only question is whether you'll accept it. But you must position yourself to walk away with all you will need, not just for now, but for the future. But the way you do it is you defend the reputation of the one they're asking you to replace. Have you read that anywhere in the scriptures? Of course, it says, do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you. So shall you be like your father who is in heaven. He makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He calls me a few days later. In fact, he calls me from the headquarters and he says, well, you called it on the nose, which is a, a racing term. And that's exactly what happened. To 
So he, he, he was and he is the CEO of the company. Now, um, any number of other things happened in the economy of the United States that affected their business. But he always, he's as bright a businessman as there is. But he always calls me whenever something major comes up. And he'll say, here is the thing. He lays the whole thing out for me. He tells me how he's thinking. He tells me how the other people are thinking. Or how he thinks they're thinking. And we go through it together. Now, he doesn't need to do that. But he's never had a father. So he doesn't now want to act apart from having a father. And uh, he, he has his own... Uh, means of flying, so he comes up and sees me whenever he wants to. Or we meet in other places. And um, we discuss at great length things that relate not just to the business, but recently he made a significant purchase of another home, and he sends me uh, all the information, asks me what, what what I should think, what I think about it. I said, this, this is operating now in the realm of strengthening your family. So I think this is, this is an excellent, I don't always agree with him, but when he's right, I always agree with him. When he's not, I challenge him. So I told him, I said, in this phase of your life, God is going to be uh, causing you to invest time and resources in developing your children, in developing the relationship with your children. And this beach house you want to buy, you should spend more time there with the family um, and, and, and engage the family that way. The, the transformation has been unimaginable. This to that has been incredible. He got an offer for the purchase of his business some time ago. And uh, as they were working through the due diligence and they came to closing, um, the, the purchasers wanted to renegotiate values at the last minute. Common trick that American businesses do. You know, they think it's clever, but it's highly unethical. Um, you know, but again, you, you, you've seen some of the things that Wells Fargo has been doing with some of their employees. Uh, highly unethical. And uh, the structure was that there would be a, a significant balloon payment down the road. And I said, we we're talking about it. And I said, no, don't, don't, don't go into that deal. Because anybody who would want to renegotiate because when they've already agreed to all of the terms and all the, due dil all the due diligence has been done, anyone who wants to renegotiate at that time, you don't want any kind of your future sitting in their hands. They're unethical. So the balloon payment will be accounted for by accounting and you won't get paid. So walk away from the the deal would have netted him 80 million from an earlier investment. He's walked away from the deal. Within two weeks of that, the company got huge contracts. And the net value of his shares have probably gone up from the 80 that he was offered to somewhere close to 150. So, walking righteously, navigating difficult <clears throat> pathways in the midst of uh, uh, shifting and changing environments is the most difficult and treacherous journey. And it requires an extraordinary degree of maturity. And maturity can only be defined as godliness. 
as righteousness. Because you cannot restrain your soul by any other means except through the Spirit of God. Now, training someone to be a father or training someone to be mature requires a father. You must understand that at the very core, our story with God is the story of a father and a son. When you, bring the, when you bring all the scriptures down to their most basic and fundamental premises, the story is the story of a father and a son. God established creation to show himself as a father. Now, the question would be, I have about 24 minutes left. So I want to talk to you about the gospel. This was the story I just told you, and I showed you strains within the story of how you raise a son to maturity. That son happened to be contextualized in business. But, but the issues are the same. How do you grow past the things that were part of the hand that you were dealt in this world. Here in the Cape, one of the most endemic of problems is fatherlessness. Hmm? It's easy to demonize the gangs. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that their activities are laudable. But it's easy to demonize the gangs and to marginalize them in our thinking as just miscreants who are to be sent to Robin Island or wherever. Polesmore. Yeah. Yeah. Polesmore. But there is an endless supply of those who will take their places. And soon enough, if, if that's our response, soon enough there'll be a penal colony and uh, that would be the majority population. The problem of humanity, whether we're talking about the Cape Flats or, or anywhere in, in, in the Cape, the problem of humanity is fatherlessness. It's a culture of fatherlessness. And it came when Adam rejected his father. It became the default setting of humanity. The fall of man was far more than a disobedient act. The fall of man had everything to do with rejecting his father and developing a culture of fatherlessness. Because the essential qualities of the culture of fatherlessness is number one, you have no identity. Because a person's identity is determined by who his father is. And if you have no reference to father, then you are on the loose. You're on the loose. And eventually, lawlessness becomes the law. It's the law of the jungle. When Adam sinned, he, do, he did two things. Number one, he clothed himself. And number two, he hid. He hid. In case, let me just, let me, I'll, reset the, the, I'll reset the mindset in a father and a son model. In the, in the genealogy of Jesus, as recorded in the book of Luke, which traces Jesus 62 generations back to Adam, when it gets to Adam, it's the one that says Jesus himself uh, being at the age of 30, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathet, and so on and so on and so on, the son of Enoch, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, who was the son of God. 
You know, these, this, this genealogical reference is not put in the Bible just to torture children in Sunday school. It's talking about multi-generational families. The concept of power, the concept of power, the Greek term dunamos, power, carries in it the very word dynasty. Dynasty. Dynasty is the way you exercise power inherently. In a dynastic format, power inheres. It is just what the family does. Think of the great houses of Europe. You know, the house of Windsor right now. When Prince Charles comes to the throne, when and if he does. Um, he will be enfranchised in power for no other reason except that he is the present Sion of a dynasty. The house of Hanover in Germany. Uh, dynastic. The easy flow of power. But for the orphan, power is, uh, power is a new thing. Because an orphan is a one generational wonder. And he rises from the bottom, grabs as much of it as he can, uses it as recklessly as he can, and is gone. He's gone. And there's nothing left of him. And the hole he left is filled by another just like him. This, the Bible is relevant. The truth is relevant. It is the foundation of our understanding, both of ourselves and the world in which we live. Unfortunately, the levels of our <clears throat> understanding have been encased in religious tradition, and therefore we separate between the real world, in quotes, and the religious world, but it ought not be so. It ought not be so. So, when when God created Adam, he put him in the earth to rule and he gave him an economy by which to rule. Um, the word for economy, the word for economy is the Greek words comprised of two terms, oikos and nomos. So oikonomia. You all understand economies. You must have an economy to guarantee the success of anything you do. The oikonomia of God. Oikos means house. And nomos means the order of the house. So, in God, the economy is an order of his house. Whenever the earth is in trouble, God dispenses, God gives out a dispensation of the order of his house to rectify it. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. Very different words. A child is the term nepios, which means an infant. That's why, where you get the word nappy from. Yeah? Kid in the nappy. Nepios, a small child. But so unto us a child is born, a napios is born, but unto us a son is given. The word there is weos, and it means a representative son, one who is capable of representing his father accurately. So the child is born to become the son who is given, because God's way of rectifying any sphere of human problems is to give into that sphere a son. Because when he does, he brings back the standard to change the environment. 
Jesus is variously called the firstborn. The firstborn. And you, you understand that the term firstborn, prototokos, um, relates to the concept of primogenitor. Primo is first, first of the generations. In the natural order, in this human world, the first son, the firstborn, was Adam, because he's the first in time. But the biblical concept of the firstborn, and the reason that Jesus is called the firstborn, though he's later in time than Adam, is this. The term firstborn means the exact representation of the father. He's the standard. That's why he's often referred to as the rod. A rod will come out of the stump of Jesse. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. The rod, you'll remember from the book of Revelation, an angel was given a rod. It's the term canon. Canon. Not in, as in canon cop, but, but canon. A canon is a ruler. It's a measuring stick. It's a template. It's what you would consider part of the Bureau of Standards. So whenever the integrity of the standard is lost and things go haywire, what you must do is go back, retrieve the original standard and import it into the situation to align everything. That's the meaning of the firstborn. That's why Jesus is called the firstborn among many sons. Now, when you are born again, when you are born of the Spirit, you are assembled to Christ. You're assembled to his spiritual body. Your spirit is assembled to his spirit. You are then not independent of Christ, you are, quote, a member of the body of Christ. He, the standard, is still in the head, but the execution of the standard is by the feet of that which is connected to him. You are that body that is the standard. Apart from Christ, you have no access to the Father. So, you are the body in which the firstborn, in which the standard is carried into every circumstance of your life. And God gives you into the various environments. God gives you into the various environments to bring back the standard of rectitude. And when you apply it, in the way it ought to be applied, they'll give you the rule of the company. In that particular setting, that's what I was telling him. You are the standard. Sit with the board members and give honor to the one that you're going to replace because that's our standard. You have to be trained up to that. And that's what spiritual fathers are. The whole model of the relationship between God and ourselves is the model of a father and a son. Adam was the son of God. And God's rule was meant to be projected in creation through his son, Adam. When Adam separated himself from God, he lost his identity as a son, and therefore he lost the mandate to be the representation of God in the earth. And he lived then as an orphan. Orphans live without reference to an identity. An orphan cannot find his identity because he cannot find his father. What do you think? What, why do you think that Islam appears to be as irrational and destructive, even against its own kind, as it is. Why do you think so? 
because the forefather, Ishmael, was put out of his father's house. He was put out of his father's house. He only knows the rule of brothers. He does not know the rule of a father. What happens when the rule is just the rule of brothers? Jealousy, envy, and strife will characterize the environment and one brother will murder the other. I have it on the authority of scripture. Because Adam separated himself from his father, he had no culture of longevity. He had no dynastic reference to impart to his own sons. And they fell quickly into the murderous entanglement of competition. And one killed the other. I was reading on the plane coming here about the Guptas. <laughs> there is no way to satiate the appetite of an orphan because it's not about money, it's always about control because it's a substitute identity. He doesn't know when enough is enough. Because it's all up to himself. There's a mindless consumption of everything, including a state, if you don't know who you are. The rule of orphans is reckless acquisition, as if he lives in a vacuum, as if what he does has no consequence beyond his own actions. So we're not just cursing the darkness. You are the light of the world. You are the sons of God. Everyone who has received Christ is a son of God and you carry the standard of the firstborn into every sphere in which God puts your foot. You don't need the permission of anyone to rule. You simply need to be the standard. And God will exalt you after, after you've been threatened, after you've been maligned, after you've been lied at, lied about, because you see, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And you're never going to convince people who are determined to preserve themselves at your expense because you are the standard and you are the obstacle to their ambitions. You're never going to convince them to come onto your side. But in your vulnerability, God has to raise you up from the dead. Your journey could actually be far more exciting than, you, than it is now, even though it's exciting enough as it is. It's a journey. Life is not a destination. Life is a journey. And it's your journeying with God. The first son, Adam, departed from the ways of God the last son, Ad, the last Adam, known as Christ, restored our understanding of who God is as our Father and ourselves in Him as His Son. You are the sons of God. The whole picture, everything God inserted into creation was designed around you being a representative of God. Hebrews chapter, two, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 puts it this way. Describing the difference between the culture of an orphan and the culture of a son. The culture of the orphan hoards. 
The culture of the orphan is based in fear. The culture of the orphan is defensive. The culture of the orphan identifies enemies. The culture of the son, however, is based in the representation of the father and is inherently vulnerable to the demands of the father. So if the father does not show up, then the son is perpetually going to be in trouble. Literally an orphan. His father was the chairman of the Department of Economics um, at a major uh, Western university. He was 10 years old when he came home to the news that his father was dead. Uh, one of the most brilliant young men I know, he's now 40 years old. First met him about um, 15 years ago. Happens to be an Indian, but that the other fellow I talked to you about is white. He and his wife, brilliant people, but many ups and downs in business. He, he was in, he's in the technology space. And um, in, the, in the tech bust of a, of a dozen years ago, um, he almost went bankrupt. Um, I have a law degree by part of my background. And so I volunteered to take on negotiating his debts for him with his suppliers. And, uh, uh, and I did that. We, it's not something I do, I just, uh, this was my son, was drowning and a, a, a skill I had that, you know, I could, uh, I could engage. And I talked very directly to, uh, to his creditors and I would say, um, whether you believe me or not, he simply doesn't have the money to pay. If you put him out of business, um, then it's a total loss. Uh, you may have some value in writing down the debt as part of your tax, uh, part of the tax consequence of an uncollectible debt, in which case you may do that. However, it is my view that he'll survive and he'll pay the debt. So it's your call. And they would, they would, they would try to argue in every, every which way about it, and I would simply say, look, um, everything you're... you're coming back to me with as a proposal presumes that I haven't told you the truth. I've told you the truth. It's not going to be any different because we can't do anything different. I'm not stiff arming you. Uh, ride the wave with us and we'll, we'll pay you eventually. But if, if that's not feasible, then I understand there's some tax benefits to writing off a an uncollectible debt, do that. The options are yours. I think 90% of the people elected to, to go with us. One of the people was Google, by the way. <laughs> it, was, it was fun negotiating with Google because they were, in those days, they were, they were young, they were a bunch of young thugs. <laughs> and it turned out they weren't, they just got to be older, older thugs, but... <laughs> But, you know, I was going to be intimidated by a group of young men. Anyway, so, you know, I, we just, uh, I, I laid it out for them. And I would, sometimes I would even say, well, what are your questions? You know, I would, I don't think they ever met anybody who was as unflappable as I was. I was taking on the role of a father to help my son stay afloat and, uh, but I would not compromise the truth. It was, it was a very limited engagement. Like I said, I, I don't do that, but this was my son, so. And that was his, the one thing about this son is because his father died, he lives in fear. He, he has, his foundation is an environment of the fear of loss. And uh, over time, brilliant. You know, so many brilliant people are unbalanced on the other side. And he, he, he 
often I have to talk to him about that, even to this day. Long story short, he has developed a private, a, a new way to search the internet and um, uh, to create your own private uh, um, portion of the internet where you can assimilate information uh, on branches and share that information with everybody. Um, uh, and it, it, uh, the basic concept, I won't go into it, the basic concept is he's divided the internet into 25 different categories so that um, when you begin your search, the moment you, you select the category of search in which the information lies, all the other references to that in all the other categories simply go away. And then you, you, you narrow the search by subcategories. So there are 25 uh, major categories and over 12,000 subcategories. So it just gets you right into the internet. The time-saving aspects of it, incredible. Um, the, uh, he's met with everybody in uh, Silicon Valley um, and everyone is extremely excited about this new technology. The reality is that he will be, he is a game changer. And that technology is coming out now. Uh, all the funds that were necessary to produce uh, not only the prototype, but to go all the way into beta uh, has been secured and so on. Um, brilliant young man who would have, I think along the way he would simply have given up. Uh, he would call me sometimes in the dead of night and um, where he's scared about something. And uh, he, he now says to me, see, I went four days without calling you. <laughs> I'm making progress, aren't I? <laughs> this is a guy who will be in Forbes in, in 24 months. He will be one of the new billionaires. But, uh, you know, but this is... This is the relationship we have. He routinely introduces me uh, in board meetings and other functions when, whenever I'm, I happen to be around. Routinely introduces me. He says, this is my father. Now he's really not my biological father, but he and I still look alike because he's an Indian. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the other day I had one of my other sons come in to visit him, who is a, a software developer. Uh, and this son said, uh, th they were talking, and uh, when I introduced them, uh, the one who has developed this technology said to the other one, he said, I think I'm his favorite son. I think I'm his best son. And the other one smiled. The other one's a cool, cool customer. He's. He's like, he's out of the magazines. I mean, <laughs> he's the picture of a, of a handsome, articulate, suave. He just got a smile. He said, <laughs> I'll let you think that. <laughs> my, my, um, my ministry is different from what you think of as a traditional apostolic ministry. The Lord showed me that I needed to invest my life in sons, to raise up sons, raise up a spiritual house that is comprised of sons, real sons, people who have a father, people who actually can uh, relate as you would to a father. And so I am a father. Uh, in my house, in the spiritual house, I'm a father. And what I've taught my sons is for them to father others. And for them to father others, whether they're in business or they're in some other profession. One of my sons is a retired dean of a, of a, a university. He has a spiritual family. So uh, years ago, the Lord showed me that... Um, there needs to be greater efficiencies 
in, in the church. And we have buildings that we barely use for the most part in the U.S. Enormous amounts of capital tied up in businesses. I mean, in church buildings and staff and the like. Um, that we, we often don't use very much. So whenever we need buildings, we rent them. And uh, the staff are primarily volunteers because everybody has a ministry. Everyone is called to a ministry. So if I'm doing something that benefits what you are doing, I'll make sure that you have the resource to do what God has called you to do. So instead of being a, 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 a centralized way of doing things, I see myself as a resource to my sons. And by resourcing my sons, they can become excellent in all of their spheres. I hope by the time I die that I would have nothing left to give out, that I would have given it all out. And it would be fully invested in all of my sons for generations because generations come out of fathers. And the concept of dynastic rule, the concept of dynastic rule emanates from a father. I've taught these sons to love one another. In fact, I've taught them that they must help one another. And I could go on with the stories of how I've had one son fund the other son without charging him interest. And how that flourished the business of the other son, but also blessed the present son, and so on. All of my sons are not in business. In fact, only a very small percentage of them are business people. But I use that component of my house to talk to you about you becoming mature, about how the principles of truth work within the context of business. This is real. This kingdom is, of ours is real. And the reality of being the sons of God is the functional paradigm that defines both our identity and structures and ordains our purpose. The two primary things that bedevil everyone in the earth are the questions, what is my identity, who am I, and why am I here? What is my purpose? Solve those questions for people and they will be freed to become everything that they were put here to be. And I'm saying to you, what I have found that works is that your connection to a spiritual father is that resourcing that answers both of those questions. I know you have to go. Thank you very much for taking the time to come this morning. I hope that the things I've said may shed some small light on things that you're dealing with. I hope that some things I may have said might be an encouragement to you.